Within each of us, there is a genetic blueprint that shapes the development and functioning of every cell in our body. And like our DNA, our core values create a foundational identity that we bring with us into each new season of life. As a church, our core values are our deepest convictions of who God has called us to be. The things that even as the world around us changes, they will continue to define who we are and how we do ministry together. Let's pray together. God, we once again just acknowledge who you are. We acknowledge that you are God, and we're not. God, we give you thanks for gathering us into this space as your people, as brothers and sisters gathered from all the places that we've come. Um, as we open up your word now, would you, um, would you slow us and still us enough to hear from you today? Would you help us to be aware of what your spirit is saying to us and where you might be nudging us and prompting us today? Um, God, we give you thanks for your word, uh, that it's been preserved for generations and centuries uh, so that we can hold it in our hands and open it together in community with one another. So God, would the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you? Amen. I just love the words of that bumper video. Uh, the no matter what, the, how the world changes, this is who we are. I just think that's such a cool phrase, um, and I maybe just want to invite you again today to to hold on to these core values. Is just that that no matter what changes around us, this is who we feel God's calling us to be. And as I already said, today's core value that we're going to look at in this series together called DNA is the value of missional engagement. Now, if you've been around Trinity for a while now, you know uh, the value that we as a church put in supporting uh, missionaries, like actual uh, mission workers, vocational missionaries, both here and abroad. You know that this is a key part of who we are. This is a key part of our DNA. And what's true is while deep support and care for those missionaries is part of this value, it's simply not all the value. There's, there's, there's much more to this value than simply uh, praying and financially supporting uh, our missionaries, the, the RCA missionaries that we are connected with. Now, this word missional uh, engagement or missional living or even just the word missional um, has been a phrase that the church has used for a long, long time. Uh, but more recently, probably in my lifetime, this word missional has become sort of a, a, sort of a, bu a buzzword, a catchphrase in the church. And for a long time, like into my adult life, I, I, just, I just didn't understand what it meant. It just confused me what it meant to live missionally or to be uh, missional. I just, I just didn't know. I just didn't understand it. I think most of that confusion was uh, from my, my growing up as a kid in an RCA church. We would, uh, we would have missionaries come and speak in our church, uh, or we would pass the offering plate for the missions offering. And uh, frankly, that was kind of the only word association with missions that I, that I had. Simply put, I understood mission or missional living uh, as something that was out there, right? Something that was separate from, from me. Uh, mission work was something that sort of the religious fanatic people did. Uh, you, know, you know the people, right? The people that choose to sell their stuff and go to another country. This is what I understood mission work to mean. It just wasn't for me. That was my grasp of this. I actually think that uh, may maybe I'm not alone because when I Googled missions, this is the first image that comes up, right? This is the sort of image that, that most of us probably think of, if we, especially if we have a church background. We probably associate, I'm probably not alone, in associating the word mission or missional living to something out there, right? Something that's not me, 
Instead of being on mission, I, I remember thinking as a kid for a long time, even in my adult life, that, that my job was simply just to be a good Christian. Right? Just to be a, a, a nice person, to be good to my neighbors. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to steal. Certainly my call wasn't to be on missions. Right? That was somebody else. I can look back now and see the flaws in my logic. Like I can understand where I fell short of my understanding, but, but, but I think I get it, right? If the word mission or missions was always something out there, always something that someone else is doing, then naturally, naturally I am not going to make any connection to my own life, right? I'm not going to make any connection to, to the idea of mission having an impact on how I live, Maybe that resonates with you today. Maybe you're kind of in that space today, and, and that's okay. We do the best we can with what we've got. That's okay. Uh, but we're going to think a little, uh, deep, a little more deeply about mission today and what that means for how we live together. There's something else I remember from being a kid. The sanctuary that I grew up, well, I didn't grow up in the sanctuary. I grew up in a house. I didn't like live in the church. Uh, the sanctuary that I went to when I was a kid, uh, it, it had a sign on the back wall above the door as you were leaving the sanctuary. Anybody want to guess what it said? Yeah. You are now entering your mission field. Raise your hand if you remember seeing this sign. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you, I had no idea what this meant. I had no idea what this meant at all. It, it, was, it, it was really just decoration for me. I, I just didn't understand it, right? I didn't make the connection to mission being anything that had anything to do with me. It really wasn't until much later, like into my adult life, that it was only then that I realized the, the, the beauty of that statement. So to help us understand missional engagement, to help us understand what it means to live on mission, to, to have a mission, uh, we're going to open up to John's gospel. Um, if you have a Bible with you, you can open it up to John 20. Uh, we're going to start at verse 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, um, that, that's okay. Um, the words are going to be on the screen behind me. So friends, hear the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, just for context's sake, it's important to know what's happening here. It's important to remember what's going on around this little passage that we read. Um, this is the same day that Jesus was resurrected. This is the same day that Jesus came out of the grave. This is the evening of that day. It's the very same day that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. Jesus has been kind of busy coming back and showing himself uh, to people. And I think what that means and why that's important that this is all happening on the same day is this. I think it shows us that there's this important connection between Jesus' resurrection and what Jesus was going to say to the disciples. There's a, a, an important connection between what Jesus was going to give as a purpose and a mission and Jesus' resurrection itself. I think it shows us that the message that Jesus was going to bring was urgent. That's happening on this very same day. I think it shows us that resurrection and mission just can't be, can't be separated. Jesus rising uh, from the grave cannot be separated from the mission that, that he gives us. Or maybe we can think about it like this. Maybe we can think about it like this, that, that the timing of this shows us that Jesus' resurrection was so that he could give this purpose. That the timing of this shows us this is why Jesus was resurrected, to come and give this mission to his disciples and to us. 
Now, there's three things that jump out to me uh, as I read this part of John 20. Uh, three things that seem important for, for thinking about missional engagement and missional living, and especially the idea of how do we live this out? Like, how do we take this core value and, and move it from a, an academic sort of understanding of a value into actual living? The first thing that stands out is this. Before Jesus says anything to his disciples about mission or purpose, before any of that, Jesus gives this sort of initial greeting, and this greeting is a gift, right? This greeting that Jesus gives is actually a gift. John says that Jesus stood there among them and said, peace be with you. What? Peace be with you. Uh, This is actually pretty remarkable for Jesus to say, considering that all these disciples uh, saw their friend in Jesus die. Here he is in the room with them. Peace be with you. Okay. Oh, and the doors are locked, and somehow this friend that we saw die is now just in the room with, okay, peace be with you. Got it. Perfect. Here's the other thing that makes this pretty remarkable. Uh, There is a sure sure assumption that we can make that the disciples were hiding in this room, locked in this room, because they would have felt the same people that killed Jesus are now going to kill them, right? That, That Jesus was killed and now it's time to go after the followers of Jesus, to squash out whatever Jesus was doing. Peace be with you. Maybe it's a little presumptuous. <laughs> but I actually don't think that's the peace that Jesus was talking about because Jesus being in that room doesn't remove those dangers. Right? We know from history that the disciples are going to have to face those dangers head on. We know that they're going to die as martyrs for their following of Jesus. So I actually don't think that's the peace that he's giving them. I actually think when Jesus says, peace be with you, I actually think he's once again extending and affirming his love for them, his mercy for them, his forgiveness of them, his favor for them. Because notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, where the heck were you guys? Like when I needed you, I was being tried unjustly. I was being murdered. Where were you? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, why are you hiding? Get outside. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't call them to repentance at all. Instead, he says, peace be with you. I think what he's saying is, hey, all those things, all those things, yeah, you probably could have been with me. Yeah, you probably don't need to be hiding in here, but those things are gone. I forgive you. Those things are in the past. Let's go forward. I actually think this is a super important part of mission. And I think Jesus says it to us too. I think Jesus says to us, peace be with you. Not like uh, peace is coming your way, but peace be with you. What, what has happened in the past, that's, that's gone. Forget about that. Forget about that and, and let's go together. Let's be on mission together. Which brings us to the second thing. It's, it's the actual sending of the disciples, right? It's the actual sending. In verse 21, Jesus says, just as the Father has sent me, so I send you, which begs the question, how did the Father send Jesus and why did the Father send Jesus? It helps us know what our sending looks like. Well, simply put, simply put, um, in John's gospel, earlier in John's gospel, we, we know John 3, 16, right? We read that God sent Jesus into the world so that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life with God forever. This, simply put, is why the Father sent Jesus, so that you and I, sinful, broken humans, can have eternal community with God. That's the simple answer. Here, here's a deeper answer. Jesus came, the Father sent Jesus to give a glimpse of the unseeable God, to reveal for us the heart and nature of God, the Father. Jesus came to begin the process of setting all things right, to usher in a new kingdom that doesn't look like the kingdoms we know, right? The upside-down kingdom of God. 
these are how the Father sent Jesus. This is how, what the Father had in mind for sending Jesus. I think maybe what's embedded in this sending then, and maybe what's embedded in the sending even for us, is this question, maybe under all this Jesus is saying in this room, do, do you believe this? Do you believe that God sent Jesus? Or maybe Jesus is saying, do you believe God the Father sent me to do these things? Maybe Jesus is uh, 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 kind of underlying, asking the question, do you believe that I'm in this room with you? Do you believe that I'm here to set all things right? Do you believe that I can set all things right? Do you believe that this is good news? If so, go. The world needs it. Not only does the world need the good news, the world needs you, I think he says to the disciples. I think he says the same thing to us. I think the world needs you. So I send you. Here's the last bit that feels important in thinking about mission. It's, it's the, the how, right? It's the holy smokes, how do we do this? Uh, you know, how on earth are the disciples supposed to do this? How on earth are the disciples supposed to go out of this locked room from hiding into a world that's pretty hostile? How on earth are we supposed to go sent just as the Father has sent Jesus? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 22 says that Jesus, uh, after sending them, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit receive the fuel, if you will, the power and the fuel to go. This is the same spirit that's breathed in us. Romans 8, uh, in Romans 8, Paul says this, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. That same spirit dwells in you in you. Have you ever felt like this idea of, uh, you know, you're now entering your mission field? Have you ever felt like this is just too much? Like, how the heck am I supposed to do this? What does this mean? What's it going to mean for me? How do I lean into this? I, I imagine most of us have felt that, and I imagine the disciples felt it too. I imagine the disciples felt it too. And here's why we feel it, because it is too heavy. It is too heavy for just us, right? The, the mission that we're sent on, it is just beyond our ability to complete. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it's only by the power of the Spirit that we can even begin to go, right? It's this Holy Spirit that empowers you and equips you to go to the places that were sent. Here's what I want to say about all this. Th this sign, you're now entering your mission field, right? Um, I, I, I told you before, there was just a season where this was just another decoration in the church to me. I just didn't understand it. I saw it every single Sunday and it was just another sign that hung on the wall. But here's, here's what I didn't grasp. Here's why it was just a decoration, because I didn't grasp this really important thing, uh, the, the important reality that, that we really are missionaries. We really are, each and every one of us, we are sent as a missionary right where we are. Right where we are. See, what makes a person a missionary? <laughs> what makes a person a missionary? According to the words of Jesus, it's going out to witness to Jesus and the kingdom of God. That's it. The only prerequisite to be a missionary is to have a mission, right? Which each of us have. Each of us are missionaries right where we are. And here's what I want to give to us today as, as we think about this as a core value. Here's what I want to say about living this out. And I'm going to use the word we. And when I say we, I mean like we, Trinity, like uh, Trinity is not just the staff. Trinity is not just 
the elders and deacons, like we are Trinity, right? If, if, if you call this place your home, you are Trinity. Like the church is us. So I'm going to use the word we, but I mean us, right? We hold this value as a value because we believe that God has put us in Hospers and in Orange City on purpose to be on mission, to be missionaries. We hold this value because it means that we are called to love others well. Holding this value means that we speak for those that can't speak, that don't have a voice. Being on mission means we stand for our neighbors who can't stand. It means seeking justice and shalom and flourishing of our entire community. Not just this space, but our entire community. I really do believe that this is why we're here. I honestly believe this is why we're here. I I, I honestly believe this is why the unfolding happened. It's great to be together. Like This is a great space but I think we're called into this space, into this body of believers for the sake of those around us, for the sake of the world, for the flourishing of our places. Do do you, um, how many of you remember this number, 958? Do you remember this number? We used to talk about this. Yeah, we used to talk about this number, 958. Um, We talked about this a lot right at the beginning of the unfolding. And and for those of you that don't know this number, uh, before the unfolding of this campus happened, uh, there was a demographic study done um, of people that lived within a five mile radius of this building, right? So five miles around this building. Um, And and that was about 1,500 people that completed this demographic study. And of those 1,500 people, 958 of them said uh, self-identified as having no uh, connection or meaningful relationship with a church, right? 958 people. Um, It's, 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 it's a lot, right? It's so much that it it was not uncommon for people to say to me, that's not true. I think it is. Um, I, I think it is. It's just, it's very jarring, right? We believe that this was our mission, was to have a connection with these 958 people because we believe that if there's not a meaningful relationship with with a church, there's probably also not a meaningful relationship with Jesus. We believe that this is why we are here. But I wonder about that. I wonder about that. 958, does that feel a little scary to anybody else? Does that like stir up something like, holy smokes, 958 people? That's a, that's a lot. So, so here, here's what I wonder about that. Your leaders, uh, your, your leaders right now are engaging in a process where we, um, we, we are wondering about honing that in. We're wondering if maybe that 958 is just too broad. So your leaders are, are working on uh, listening to voices outside of of this space outside of sort of the, 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 the church space in Hospers to listen to stories, to, to listen to, um, to, to where gaps are, to where uh, what strengths are, to what weaknesses of our community are. And, and let me say, we certainly hope that those 958 people come to a meaningful relationship with Jesus, right? That is absolutely our prayer, but we wonder if maybe we're called to something a little more specific. As we've listened to people, uh, people in our community, but not affiliated necessarily with our circles, we've noticed a trend. The, the trend is this, that there are unseen, unknown, maybe even at worst unwanted members of our community that are around us all the time. That, that either intentionally or unintentionally feel ignored. I wonder about them. I I wonder where they fall in that 958 because I imagine that they probably all fall in that 958. I wonder about them. 
I actually wonder if those are the people that we're called to see. I actually wonder if we are uh, uh, called to hear them, to know them. Why? Because I think God wants to know them. And I think if, if, if God desires to know them and be with them, then I think that's a good enough reason for us to desire to want to know them and see them. There's going to be more to come on this, but I, I think maybe what I want to just do is invite you to pray for that process of wondering that the, that the 958 isn't going away. That number might even be growing. But maybe pray for that process of, of, of discernment, of, of wondering, like what, what of that 958 are we really called to lean into well? Who in that 958 do we need to see that we're not currently seeing today? I, I just want to invite you to pray for that process and pray for your leaders as we think more about that. Second, I, I wonder if you'd be really willing to think about something with me. I wonder what resonates with you in all of this. I wonder what stirs up in you in thinking about there being unseen, unheard, ignored, or unwanted adults, children, families, like within football throwing distance of this space. I wonder if you'd just be willing to notice what stirs up in you. What might God be calling us to? Or, or, or just, just us as individuals, what might God be calling us to? Here's how I want to end. Um, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. There's a, a commentary or a theologian named Frederick Bruner. Have you heard this name before? He's a, a, a well-known, uh, reformed uh, New Testament theologian. Um, in, in studying for this sermon, I, I read something he wrote. He, he said, if, if that's true, if that's true, that as the Father sent Jesus, now Jesus sends his disciples and in turn us, he, he asserts this question, can we not then say, for God so loved the world that he sent Shanna or Kelsey or Pat? For God so loved the world that he sent us. Sure, we, we are not Jesus. We don't pretend to be Jesus, but I wonder if that's true, I wonder if that is the case, that God loves the world so much that he would send you and me to be instruments of grace, to be instruments of shalom, to be instruments of flourishing right here. Not somewhere out there for someone else to do, but right here in our place. I wonder if you'd sit with that today. I wonder if you'd sit with this question of, uh, what if this is true, that, that God loved the world so much that he sent me in you may that be so may that be so let's pray together gracious God we um, yeah, we just ask for nothing more than for you to use us God we acknowledge that, that we are we are broken and we are incomplete we are insufficient by ourselves and yet for some reason you choose us as your instruments. For some reason you choose us to be um, agents of flourishing right where we are. So God, we ask for both um, continued equipping and empowering to do that. We, we ask for courage and openness to lean into that when you call us to do so. We ask for eyes to see hearts to know those people around us that feel ignored unheard, unwanted God would we show them a, a vision of you the vision of you that says I see you I desire to be with you God would that be our heart today would you give us the courage to do that well today God we love you 
and we praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, would you